Hey everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History. And we are in the field out at Poverty Point, a prehistoric Native American site that is gonna blow your mind. We're with site manager, Mark Brink. Mark, thank you so Hi. much <laughs> for having us out, dude. Yeah, this is an sure epic thing. site. So just real quickly, give us the rundown of Poverty Point. Okay, there's, there's a lot to run down, but the basic in a nutshell, about 3,500 years ago, a distinct group of indigenous native people, American Indians, created the largest community and earthworks for their time and place. So the state manages 400 acres of this site today, roughly three square kilometers. And the earthworks are unparalleled in size and scale during this period. And they did it all as hunters, fishers, and gatherers. And that's basically what sets this site apart from other sites of any period anywhere is that this, you have hunter gatherers that are constructing mounds. Right. So the thing is hunters, fishers and gatherers construct mounds, but usually not on this size, or not on this scale, scale okay. and they don't live amongst the, the mounds in a community permanently okay cool now so. what was it about this this location because when we were driving in here today i mean there's a lot of flat land around right. why this spot so we're sitting in the middle of what is the the delta so it is wide open flat ground and if you're an ancient person do you want to build your home where it floods no you don't want to build your home where it floods today and these people certainly were the same so they picked a spot that is on top of an ice age or Pleistocene ridge. Okay. So we're sitting at the edge of it right here at the site and you're dealing with the floodplain way over that way. So that land behind us is about 20 or 30 feet lower than the land we're standing on here. So you have access to the rich resources of the floodplain, all the food that, that would provide you. Okay. But also the upland environments. This is called an ecotone. So it straddles two different environments and you have access to at least double the amount of variety, right? And that's handy as a hunter, fisher, and a gatherer to have a variety of foods that you can pick and gather and hunt from all different seasons. So basically, if you were to walk onto the landscape, this is the best spot in hundreds, or maybe not hundreds, but in a, in a wide area. Yeah, to, probably, probably to hundreds live. of miles. Hun I, don't, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Yeah. Right, because south of here, it's all floodplain, right? They picked a nice high spot on the ridge. So this place was high and dry even in 1927, the year of the Great Flood. Oh, wow. And even a greater flood in the mid-1800s happened when we have records that this was a, a safe place then, too. So now that we know why they're here, right? let's go look at some things that they constructed on site so we can better understand this site. You got some places you can take us? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. All right, let's go. So what's th this is the main entrance, I guess you could right. say, for the site by water. What's what's remarkable about this feature? Okay, so there's there's a few things that we need to know. First of all, no trains, planes, or automobiles. If you're an ancient person anywhere, water travel is your best way to access something like this community and these earthworks, for example. And so this access is behind us, and this is what we call the dock. So if you're here 3,500 years ago, traveling by dugout, right, by canoe, you're beaching everything down there and walking up this gentle slope. And what you notice is that there is a steep bluff or escarpment all along the edge of this mason ridge. This is literally your only access point for miles north and miles south. And it may have been artificially created by the people, but we're not sure. What was created was a ridge that is right in front of us here. And it would obscure, so you once you, you came in with a dugout and walked up, you would only see the mounds, you would only see the ridges, you would only see the plaza after you walked up the ridge. And it's as if you left the world you knew behind and entered the new constructed world the created landscape that was built by the Poverty Point people. That's a yeah. really cool idea. Right. So you're traveling for miles and miles and miles and you get to this embankment right here, or this gentle slope. You park your canoe and you start to walk up and you do not see the site until you're, you crest up to it and you're going to see it all at once. Right. Your entire journey 
these mounds and earthworks are blocked out by this bluff. So you only see it after you arrive, after you receive word, and, hey, I want to check this out for whatever reason, uh, whether it be ritual, ceremony, uh, seeing family, etc. Uh, you would only see everything come into view all at once. And see, it's just like that is impressive to us in our time, it's going to be just as much, if not even more impressive to them at their time. You know, you're talking hunter-gatherers who've never seen a massive settlement like this, and I bet that impact was just, you know, it, it was huge. Yeah, yeah. it was, it, it's one thing that points to the site being built to impress other people, at least in some small way. So what we can say about mounds and earthworks on this scale is that they project your power and influence, but we can talk more about that when we get to Mound A, for cool. sure. Sounds good, let's go check it out. Brilliant. So this is the largest mound on the site, right. correct? What's yes. the story with this feature? <laughs> so the story is one of, we don't know why it was built, but this mound is here and it must have been significant for the people. Surely because it took a lot of organization to construct, a lot of dirt to construct, a lot of organization, labor, all these sorts of things are, are true. So Mound A, certainly the tallest and the largest we have on site, 72 feet high, and it would have, well, needed 390,000 tons of dirt in order to build it. And in today's terms, that's about 30,000 standard dump trucks. So you can imagine how crazy that would look, but they didn't even have dump trucks. They didn't have horses or donkeys or oxen. They moved this with thousands of people, and about 15 and a half million loads of dirt carried in baskets and bags wow. to create the single largest mound in North America at the time and remained the biggest for about 2,200 years. And so this is currently the second largest earthen mound in North America. Yes, exactly. Including Mexico? Yeah, I mean, north of the Valley of Mexico, but okay. yeah, roundabouts. So. Now, this had a really unique construction method, starting with a cone and then they did the pla platform. Can, yeah, can you so, explain that? This mound is very different than the others in terms of construction. So it was built in phases, but three big phases. So that tall part is what people call the cone. That was built first. And the soil looks pretty similar throughout, what's called homogenous, right? And then you have the platform here next to it, and that's built of different colored soils next to each other, which needed to be collected and quarried from different places in the environment and put together. So it looks almost like a mosaic, different, different tans, blacks, grays, all mixed together to create a, a pretty little picture almost. And then you have a ramp that connects the two that was built last. So back then when, when this was freshly made, would you have been able to see those different colored uh, of, um, of soils in this kind of mosaic pattern? Yes, you would. Wow. So it would have been really bright. It really would have popped. We think it was done that way with a purpose because it took so much effort to bring in that soil from different places. That's so cool because when you come up from the, the dock and you see this beautifully colored mosaic earthen mound, that right. must have been mind-blowing to the people yeah. at the time. Absolutely. I agree with you. Now, would they have had... Over time, would grass would have grown on it, or would they have, you know, repatched it or re-fixed it back up? Right. Yeah. So it's hard to say how they would have kept grass off of it. Uh, it would have taken over eventually. And this is what I want us to think about today, because if you visited mound sites in North America, do they look about the same? That's because erosion has taken place. That's because grass has grown where the mound would have been bare. When all of these things were freshly built, I bet you would have been able to tell different cultures created them. Because all of these different people, spanning, starting 7,000 years ago, created mounds, all belonging to different cultures who spoke different languages and had different beliefs. So we've had mounds for a long time. They're built over a long period of time, and they all had very different purposes. Now, is this the... This this isn't the oldest mound on the site. There are older mounds in the surrounding area. Right. But this th here is kind of where you first start to see mounds constructing in this area. Is that correct? So, 
Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so mounds are first built starting in Louisiana at least 7,000 years ago. That's the oldest site we know of, and it's close to Baton Rouge. Okay. Okay, so you have at least 16 of those mount those old, old mound sites in the middle archaic built. And then you have about 2,000 years of a break. So you don't have mounds produced for almost 2,000 years until the people at Poverty Point start building them again, but on a size and scale that is not yet seen. So Mound A was certainly the largest built at that point, and it far surpassed any of the other mounds that Native people had ever built. Now, this isn't a burial mound or a funerary mound, right. correct? So here's, here's what's up, folks. When you look in any of the big mounds of Poverty Point, whether it be Mount E, or A behind me, or B up to the north, you find mostly dirt. You find very few artifacts. You don't find any human remains. Unlike the plaza or the ridges, you don't find post holes for structures. So why do thousands of people come together and build seemingly useless piles of dirt? So that's the question we're seeking to answer. And we assume that there's a lot of ceremony, probably some religious purpose here, and yet we don't know what their religion was 3,500 years ago. But I can tell you that from a people perspective, we can gain some meaning. So if you look at Mount A, you see that it's big, right? And if you remember when you were a kid, seeing a skyscraper for the first time, what would you have felt, right? Just, oh, wow. Exactly. Yeah. And these mounds had a similar effect on people back then. And it would have signaled you know, power, wealth, prestige, all of these things. Whether we like it or not, we consider these, uh, these, these thoughts when we look at something big and impressive, mm -hmm. or even something small and impressive. So this is called costly signaling theory, and it's the same reason why someone buys a Corvette instead of a camera. So what's the difference? Money. Money, yeah. right? Resources. Yeah. And mounds take labor, okay, time is money, right? Lots of time, um, lots of organization. So some kind of leadership for this big project, uh, which hasn't been true for, for most mound sites up to this point. Not anything this big. Right. So there's a lot that goes into it. So how long did it take to construct this mound? Was it done all at once or was this added to over and over again over hundreds of years? Right. So most mounds, um, you find that they're built in layers, right? stratigraphy, soil layers, because they take breaks. With Mount A, so far, the archaeology has shown that they didn't take any breaks to create this mound, that it was done in a single continuous process. That's insane. One, yeah. So one, one event, basically, a bunch of people gathering at one time to create this mound. More or less. Either that is true, or they have the world's largest tarp. <laughs> and we don't think that's likely. So, they, yeah, they would have needed to do it all at once because during construction, we don't find evidence of rain or insects interrupting or burrowing into these surfaces mm -hmm. or trees growing or grass growing or anything like that, like you would normally find in a mound yeah. on weathered surfaces. That's so, so fascinating. Now, keep in mind, folks, that archaeology is a process. That is our answer right now. If more people do work here in the future, that can and it very well may change because that's something to be skeptical of right the largest mound on the site also built the most quickly and no other mound we can see in the world being built this quickly by this many people and their hunters and fishers and gatherers if it's true it's incredible it can tell us a lot about the site um, but it may change. Well, and see, that's a great point that you bring up. Yeah. And this, this is true for any discipline when you're dealing with the past. You know, we are present people trying to figure out what happened way back when. We weren't there, so we don't know for a fact. Even in the historical records and documents, you could have a document that says, this is what happened there. Well, that person could have lied. It happens all the time. So, you know, this is our best understanding and interpretation of what might have been, and it's subject to change. And that is what makes history so epic, is because no matter what, you, can, you think you know everything there is to know about it, and then all of a sudden new evidence will come up that will completely change and rewrite the entire picture, the whole story. And that's what's fascinating. And this story that's here is one that's continuing to evolve as work right. is being done. Yeah, and that's going to be true with any 
any of these mound sites. So the difference here is that we're dealing with prehistory instead of history. So the difference is no written records at this site. Yeah. And because it is so ancient, we have to start from the bottom up. We're going to look at the dirt, the geology, and we're going to look at the material culture, the artifacts. And these are all little dots that we tried to connect, except we're missing a lot of the dots. Yeah. So that's why conjecture is going to change. That's why interpretation is going to change as we collect more of these dots to paint a better picture. Yeah. Now, how much archaeology is being done here on site presently? And what types of archaeology is being done? So we are always doing archaeology. The thing that people, people think that archaeology is digging, and that is true. You have to ground truth in. But it's better to do a lot of archaeology in the lab for analysis, okay, uh, and also geophysically. So geophysics, earth physics, right, you're using instruments like ground penetrating radar, magnetometers, which me measure magnetic resistance. You can take thermal images with drones. You can do seismic tests with sound waves, basically. And there's a lot of different techniques that you can look at the dirt find features, and then take soil cores or excavate where you need to. Because the number one goal is preserving the site mm -hmm. and understanding it when we can. Okay. So you guys have, you, you constantly are having work done on site yes. to better complete and understand the picture of this site. Yes. Which is why your story is always evolving because yes. you're finding new things. Every year my interpretation will change at least in a small way. So that means in five years, this whole episode could be wrong. Like, you just throw it away. It could be yeah. terrible because they find something that completely rewrites the story. But as for right now, what we're explaining is the best interpretation up to this point. Yes. That's cool. So if you had been on site 10, 20 years ago, maybe even less, you would have had rangers tell you that Mount A was built in the shape of a bird. Really? Yeah, it's very popular interpretation, but there's absolutely huh. no physical evidence for this idea. But people thought it looked kind of like a bird flying into the West. Yeah. Um, I tell you that it probably doesn't. Yeah. But you can believe it if you see it. <laughs> um, but interpretation, you know, can be cleaned up a whole lot. Yeah. Right? Just think about it um, with the evidence you have. Cool. There's a lot more to see to this site, and we're going to check it out. Let's go. Yeah. So this is the main plaza for the entire site. How right. far does this plaza stretch? So it's 43 acre plaza. For the, the full, you know, diameter from this point here all the way to the other side, it's about 2,000 feet. So where those trees are? Way, uh, even, even, way, way over there, those those trees. That gets pretty close to the entire plaza. Wow, that's for, huge. For mo yeah, for most other sites in North America, you can fit the footprint just inside the plaza. Wow. So it gives you a sense of the scale. So the plaza is an earthwork. The ridges here are an earthwork. Which is what we're standing on. We're standing right yeah. at the base of one of these ridges. Yeah, this is the base of one of the ridges. The plaza is just beginning behind us. Okay. So it gives you a sense of how big these earthworks are and how big they extend. Well, just how massive this site is. I right. mean, you know, for later comparison, most Mississippian complexes can fit inside this plaza. Right. That is nuts. Why build something so big? Because another unique feature about this plaza is that it's been built up, correct? Correct. So In many places. Yeah. Over most of the plaza that we can tell so far. So get into that. It's, how, how, how do you know this has been built up? Why was this built up? Okay. And what's going, what, what is the reasoning behind that? So when you want to know if an earthwork has been built by people or is something natural, you're going to dig into it. In this case, we do a lot of soil cores. And when you, you put a little core down, right, it takes a little punch out of the dirt, out of the soil. And you look closely at it. And you can tell that the natural surface has been stripped away. And so the native people probably used it to create ridges, mounds, something like that. So this, this much of this plaza area, much of it, has been used as borrow to create other things. And then sometime later on in that period, over the span of hundreds of years, I said, hey, wait, guys, let's fill it back in. Let's use it for something else. So it shows you that use of the site probably changes over time. And not only do we find this borrow 
and Phil episode, we find these massive structures in the plaza. So you can see these white uh, markers behind me, and those represent where we find diameters, how big the diameters are from post circles or timber circles. People will call them wood hinges, but that's not technically correct. We know they're building huge circles of these timbers. We don't know what purpose they serve, but they're being built one, two at a time over that span of roughly five or 600 years, being removed and replaced, removed and replaced. Now, is there any astrological or calendar base uses to these at all? Not that we can tell. Not that you can tell. So if we find more evidence for it, I'll let you know, but otherwise, we don't have a clue what these things are used for besides ritual and ceremony. Right, so just a big giant mystery box. <laughs> yes, exactly. But in the future, we can do more excavation. We can examine the soil that's found inside these big features and compare it to what we find elsewhere in the plaza or other parts of the site. And it can give us clues as to activities that are taking place here. Because people, whether you like it or not, leave behind micro artifacts everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you walk in your house with bare feet for a while? What happens to the bottom of your feet? So you drop stuff, your skin falls off, your toenails. Yeah. You collect dust and you collect okay. little items on the bottom of your feet. Okay. And we can find evidence of these micro artifacts in these surfaces and give us maybe a sense of what the people use this area for. Okay. Well, what's the speculation of the use of the area? Nothing good. We just don't have anything solid. Okay. So that will take some future archaeology. Now we assume that there was some special ritual purpose, right? Uh, within where something's happening and without. Okay. We so, don't know what it is. So these wood circles that we, we've got one shown here, one shown there, are they the only ones or were they kind of spread out at, throughout the plaza at different times? Yeah. So you're looking at two shown examples of at least 35 wow. post circles built over that roughly five or 600 span. Six, six, five to six hundred years span. So me. five to six hundred years, they're building circles and circles and out of yeah. these wood posts all right. around the plaza. And what we find is they often overlap. Huh. So they're built in roughly the same space sometimes, okay. but they also shift in areas. So we have a cluster here, we have a cluster there, we have a cluster there. We haven't found any at the northernmost part of the plaza yet. They're mostly in the central and the southern part of the plaza, which is where we are now. Okay, and and the the mounds themselves, or the 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 semicircle of mounds, starts ridges. here. Ridges. Ridges. Yes. The, the ridges run from here, wrapping all the, the way, way around. around. Yeah. That's so cool. So it I mean, is. we're basically in in on the periphery of, of the heart of the site. Right. That's cool. The, the center was the plaza and everything radiates out from the center. Okay. Now there are other mounds on site. You wanna go take a look at those? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, this is where it's getting cool. <laughs> okay, so behind us, we have part of what is the oldest part of the site, this mound here, correct? The oldest created part. The oldest the created part. Right. right, so you're looking at a created environment and the poverty point people began their earthworks, as far as we can tell, with Mound B here behind me. So this is the oldest one, dating to about 1650 BCE. Okay. And it's the first time that a group of native people created a mound for almost 2,000 years. Wow, so there's, so there's yeah. a huge span of time between when the last mounds were created and right. now. Exactly, and by a completely different culture, probably meaning something very different with this earthwork. Okay. Um, so they probably occupied a small area over in the field there uh, and then moved to where the ridges are today. Um, but Mound B was created long before any of the other earthworks were probably even thought of. Okay, how much time is between uh, m this mound here and the largest mound, the main mound? About 400 years. Oh wow, so that's a so, great span of time. Yeah, so think about how old the U.S. is. Yeah. Is it 400 years old yet? <laughs> no, <laughs> not no yet. it's not. But these people live sustainably and successfully for at least 600 years, and they're building generationally different earthworks over time. I got you. Now what type of mound, what, what was the purpose of this mound? Why, why build a mound to begin with? We don't know. So, <laughs> When you think of prehistory, you're going to deal with a lot of perspective. Unfortunately, with this site being so old, we don't have any written records, right? Uh, we're going to look at the artifacts. And so 
people have done excavations in the mound. And we haven't found a whole lot of artifacts giving us a sense of what the mound was used for. Now, what I will say is if you talk to your present day tribes and nations, even in the area like the Choctaw or the Tunica Biloxi, there are origin stories that talk about their first people emerging from mounds or caves near mounds. So whether or not there is an origin story that these people told about Mount A or any of the others, it gives you a sense of these earthworks representing something bigger as part of your cosmology, personal belief, origin, it's hard to say. Okay. So mounds do have meaning, we just don't know what they meant to this particular group of people. And uh, we have dug inside, like I said, so you see how Mound B here is kind of humpbacked? You see that big divot there, and that is from archaeology in the 50s. So back then, a lot of archaeologists really focused on, on what? What do we think mounds are for oftentimes? To uh, put stuff in funerary. Right, for burials, right? And some Hopewell people use conical mounds, just like this one for burying their dead, but those are much younger sites, much younger mounds. So when they dug into this, they removed about a third of the mound, scraping it out with a tractor uh, and a specially made scraper. Mm -hmm. Didn't recover any bodies, didn't recover a whole lot of artifacts. Uh, they did find some charcoal bits on some of the construction surfaces, so we can at least tell you how it was constructed and phases over time. And we can also tell you the age due to the charcoal bits. Okay, so that's how this mound is known as dated, is by the charcoal remains that right. were found there. C14 dating. Now, is there habitation around the mound or in the vicinity? Not a whole lot. Yeah. We have some light occupational debris in the field beyond, but okay. besides that, not a whole lot until you get back in the ridges where most of the community would have lived. Okay. This site has got a very cool, very complex history that spans a very long period of time. This being the beginning part of that aspect of Poverty Point. So we want to go check out some more of this site, and I know you guys are going to love to see what's next. Cool. So one of the fascinating aspects about this site is, is that th there was no agriculture done here, correct? Right. Yeah, as far as we can tell so far. Now, when archeologists first started working here professionally, right, mostly in the 50s and onward, uh, people assumed that there was agriculture here because of the size and complexity of the earthworks. And yet, as we did the ground truthing, we did the digging, we didn't find any evidence of cultivated species. So that would come from pollen samples that we can take from excavations. It could also come from what we call flotation tests. What are flotation tests? So that is where we float samples of dirt, right? So when you drop dirt into a bucket, it usually sinks. Mm -hmm. But what floats? The seeds and things. Oh, okay. Right, so all that kind of organic like material like seeds will float to the top when you can collect and analyze it. And the thing is that after looking at all the pollen that we can collect and all the seeds, we don't find any cultivated varieties. So we know, or we're very confident at least, that people lived off the land, mostly gathering, and then certainly fishing, and then sometimes hunting. So right. ha uh, this, I mean, this is such a huge site, and right. to rely off of hunting, hunting and gathering you know, can the landscape support that type of lifestyle? Yes, and this site proves it, right? This is certainly the largest community of hunters and gatherers building the largest earthworks that we can tell. This is the apex. This is the most that we can see hunters and gatherers support. But it, it happens all over the world, especially on the West Coast. So if you go to California, Oregon, Washington State, do those people ever farm? No. no, they don't. Even in historic times, they never developed agriculture because they didn't need to. If you can live off the land and a rich environment, you're working maybe four, six hours at most. And that sure beats working eight to ten hours a day, especially during harvest season, right? Mm -hmm. You can work much more than that. So it makes sense from a labor perspective. And you have time, free time, to create art to create mounds, to create earthworks, to do other things. 
So it shows that you can make it if you have the system down and you know what you're doing. And that's one of the reasons why they had the time right. to create these large earthworks and the art yeah. that they created. Exactly. It's because they had their food sources down pat. They didn't have to worry. They could just go out there and grab what they needed. Right. And the floodplain that's behind us here replenishes seasonally as the river floods. Right? So if you're, you're gathering a lot of um, water-based resources like fish, roots and tubers and things like that, that replenishes every year. Mm -hmm. What kind of foods were they eating? So everything. So <laughs> when, when we're, whenever we do excavations um, that can be well preserved, we find nearly everything you can imagine was on the menu in this environment. Like what kind of, give us some examples. Sure. So every kind of freshwater fish, uh, they like catfish and bowfin a whole lot for yeah. whatever reason. Um, as far as animals, lots of ducks, turtles, alligators, um, bears, anything large or small. Uh, same with birds, even birds you wouldn't think of eating today. They were eating them all back then. Uh, what's really interesting, one site shows us that they were importing food. So we find evidence of red snapper up here, which oh, would have had wow. to come up from the Gulf. So some of that food is imported. Now, every nut was available uh, to these people. We can find evidence for it, right? Because the sea, that, excuse me, the shells, like pecans uh, and hickory nuts uh, for certain, lots of acorns were eaten, but those things preserve really well. We're missing, you know, the leafy greens, right? That were likely a big part of their diet, but we, they don't preserve. Now, how were they uh, prepared? One of the things that's really famous about this site are the little cooking balls right. that they have. What What is it about those that is unique to this site what, sure. and, and all that? So that's a really good question. So what we call poverty point objects, they are shaped earthen ceramic balls. Everywhere else in North America, people are cooking with hot rocks, but there's no native stone to this site. And yet you have to feed potentially thousands of people. So you do it in the same way, but creating your own heat elements with the poverty point objects. Uh, and they come in six standard shapes, which were likely symbolic to the people. Um, so there, there are six different shapes. At least. Of yeah. these balls. Okay. <laughs> right. And some come in weird shapes occasionally. Uh, we call those decorated poverty point objects, but they probably weren't used for cooking. Okay. But yeah, people were heating these objects, placing them in hearths, like that they dug into the ground, place your food in there, and it's a way to roast your food over long periods. It's very efficient because your, your embers, your wood, you know, it dies down, it loses heat. So these, um, these objects would hold the heat for a much longer period. So they're not taking these balls and putting them in a pot to heat up the water, which then cooks the food. You presumably could, and people are doing it. Okay. But these things get very muddy when you introduce water. Right. So if they're doing that, they would make very muddy stews. Yeah, yeah. So it may have happened, uh, but we do see more evidence for roasting rather than boiling, like you'd find with boiling stones. Okay, so now my curiosity has peaked. So yes. you've got, you heat these cooking balls up separately. Yes. Correct? And then you prepare where you're going to uh, where you're going to cook your meal, and then you take the balls that are heated separately and put them in the space where you're going to be cooking your, feel, your meal and then covering it up? You could. So here's the thing. Sometimes we find clusters of these poverty point objects with lots of charcoal, meaning that they're heating and cooking in the same place. Okay. But sometimes we find hearths without any charcoal at all, but lots of poverty point objects. Okay. So like most artifacts, like most things that we find, there is likely a multitude of functions. Yeah. They could even be used to heat homes, like, like a space heater if it gets cold. So you could have a fire outside with a bunch of these things and bring them in with tongs in order to heat houses, but cook food, all kinds of things. You know, what's fascinating is, is that, you know, these, these cooking balls are a, a definitive technology that is unique to this site. Right. You know, you see it spread throughout other sites. Right. But it, w it originated here. As far as we can tell, yes. Yeah. How right. far out did this technology reach? Um, in some cases, it reaches the Atlantic coast of Florida. So that's about the furthest flung because people are traveling by water, most likely. 
but you can see it as far north as Missouri, parts of Kentucky, up in that area, almost into the Midwest. Uh, so at least 700 square miles we find evidence for this culture that emanated from the site. So this is the center of a unique culture, and the people who practice this culture may not have even spoken the same language or had a lot of personal connections, but they bought into what they were doing here at right. the site. How far do you see, that leads to another point, which is how far do you see this culture's impact? I mean, how far are they trading? How far, yeah. how are goods coming into the site? Are right. goods being produced here and going outward? So at least 700 square miles of, you know, is pretty close influence. Um, the thing is, we don't know if people on the site are trading, exchanging in a different way, or acquiring or going out to get items in stone and bringing it back here. So really, we, we don't know, but all these rocks and materials don't uh, form here naturally. So every bit of stone that we find on site that's made into a tool was imported or acquired from somewhere and they show up here. Wow. What's the so. furthest you have items coming from to here? Probably about a thousand miles. That's um, the Galena, which occurs up in Iowa. Okay. Uh, some of the copper was thought to have come from the Great Lakes, but in our most recent testing, we find that it all has an Appalachian source. But okay. that's still a pretty far distance, probably about the same as Galena in some cases. Yeah. So inside the museum, you guys have some fantastic displays with some of the actual artifacts that right. come off of site. And these are the cooking balls that we were talking about earlier. Can right. you go into detail about what those were again? Right. So as the name suggests, they're used for cooking. So the best word we have are what archaeologists call them are poverty point objects. They are synonymous with this site and the material culture that was created by these people. And they are the single most common artifact that you can find here archaeologically. Huh. So there's an estimated between, say, 12 and 13 million of this single artifact on the site. Whoa, you're kidding! I'm not. That many? <laughs> yeah. That's wild. <laughs> So if you put a shovel anywhere where there's occupation, you're probably going to find some of these, at least in part, sometimes some whole ones. And they're often clustered together in these little features that you see. Um, so that's their hearths or their earth ovens or what we call them. So they were heated, they were clustered together, and you put food in and amongst them. Mm -hmm. And that heat given off by these objects would cook the food. So, so that's how they would be used. You would create create a, a little, little fire, a little yeah. hole, and then put your food down in there. And well, you'd get these hot first. Get these hot yeah. first, okay. And just like if you were doing charcoal cooking, do you put the food on when those briquettes are fresh and hot, or do you let it cool down? That's a good analogy. So these yeah. give you a lower, more even heat source than your embers or a hot burning fire. And so you cook your food and you don't burn it. Have any yeah. ha Has anybody tried to do any experimental archaeology using these? Not good experimental archaeology. Yeah. Uh, so... A guy named John Gibson, he did a lot of work here, archaeologist, for, for decades in Louisiana, and he loved this site. So he did some experimental archaeology with this over a few beers, and they had fun with it, but not anything, you know, professionally done right. as far as a study goes or a big paper. Now, the surface area is going to be different because they're all shaped a little different. So they do give off heat at different rates, but we don't think right now that that was the intended purpose. Uh, even if that did happen. So how many different shapes are there? There's six standard shapes, but there's a number of other outliers, all kinds of different shapes, amorphous ones, yeah. um, but six standard shapes. So, and, oh, oh, go ahead. No, I'm, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So you've got six different shapes. Is there any kind of, I, I know we don't know for, you know, because we weren't there, but yeah. any kind of sim symbolism there, or is there a utilitarian purpose to these different shapes? Probably both, both are true, okay. as is usual. Um, so the shapes were probably meaningful because we find this cooking technology elsewhere at other sites that are not related to Poverty Point. And you can cook bits of fired earth and then use it to cook other food. And the shape doesn't matter a whole lot. Yeah. So the shapes were likely meaningful for the people. 
because they're created without a lot of variance over a large cultural area. So you can find poverty point objects that look just like this along the Atlantic coast in Florida. You can find them throughout wow. the lower Mississippi Valley at sites along the Gulf Coast even, and up into Missouri and Kentucky at a few sites. Now, are those pieces that were made there locally or here and transported there? Combination. So you do really? find poverty point objects made at this site and other locales, or that's the thought so far with uh, the most recent archaeology. So archaeologists have taken a number of these, and yes, we destroy some of them for analysis because it, they answer important questions. And we take thin sections, cross sections of these okay. things, and we compare the, the soil makeup, the mm -hmm. makeup of these different things, and we can understand that some of these left the site and went to other places and vice versa. That's so yeah. cool. What's the furthest away that one has traveled that was made here mm -hmm. on this site? It's a good question. I don't know offhand, at least to the Gulf Coast, maybe one of these Florida sites. Wow. Um, now, I can tell you that some objects um, like this did come from the Tennessee River Valley and made its way to this site, which is kind of interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. So there's some white kaolinitic clay rich dirt that was fired in that area and then made into a type of poverty point object. From the Tennessee Valley all yeah. the way to here. Mm -hmm. That's so, so cool. <laughs> they, go, they go out and then some of them in different forms arrive here. So there's some kind of meaning to these things that we don't yet understand. Wow. And well, that's what makes all this worthwhile is, is, right. is to try to understand and to learn and figure out the journey is better than the destination, I guess you could say. And we can say that about the mountains too. Yeah. So if you look at Mount, Mount A, for instance, do you think it took a lot of people to build it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Have you ever done a project with your, your friends, like a tree house or plant a garden or what have you? Does it make you feel closer together or further apart? Brings you closer together. It, brings yeah. you, it creates social ties. It creates social ties yes. for the people to construct these earthworks. And it creates social ties from people outside if they're coming in and assisting, right, with this barn raising. Yeah, it makes them know. feel ownership. Exactly. Yeah. It makes you feel connected to this place. Yeah, and to the people. And maybe some of those folks want to take a piece of this place home with them. That's a great right. perspective. I like that. I never thought of it like that. That's cool. You've got a lot more things in this museum. I mean, right. this is a world-class museum. Let's... <laughs> I think it could be better. We're doing the best with the space that we have. Well, right? you guys are doing a fantastic job with yes. the space that you have. Right. Is there some other things you'd like to show us? Yeah, we can talk about a number of things in the museum. Ah, okay, cool. Let's okay. go check it out. Okay. Now, there's a variety of stone tools that have been found here at right. the site. And stone tools are the most prolific because they're the ones that survive. Yes, yeah. 100%. What are the kind of stone tools that are found here? So, good question. So, what most people are going to recognize is a, a tool like this. So, what do most people call this artifact? The arrowhead. Right. Yeah. So, I surprise people when I tell them that this is not an arrowhead. And most of these artifacts that you've seen were never used at the end of an arrow. Mm -hmm. So, why is that? Because they didn't have that technology? Exactly. Yeah. So, bow and arrow technology is really late in the American Southeast. Only coming into play large scale by about 700 AD or CE. So, before that, how do you hunt? Are the deer going to sit still if you come and stab them and try to eat them, right? <laughs> yeah. Would you sit still if someone tried to kill you? No, no. No. So you got to reach out and touch someone. Most of the time, these tip the ends of throwing spears or darts, okay, that were launched by a tool called an atlatl. Sometimes it, they were used at the end of fixed spears for thrusting and often on the ends of knives, right? right. So we have knives today. They're yeah. metal. They're nice. This would have fit into a handle, right? That's why we have the stem or this half of the area. So here's the funny thing. So think about clothes. Do they come in different styles? Yes. And do styles of clothes change over time? Mm -hmm. Right? Are we wearing, you know, full suits today with breast pockets? No, we're not. That stuff goes out of style. And these artifacts go out of style and they can help us date sites. So, 
a lot of these points that we have behind us are in styles uh, that were named here at Poverty Point. So you have local place names like Mason, mm -hmm. Motley, Delhi, Epps, and Pontchartrain, which is a little further afield, but it was still named on the site. So when we find these from excavation and we find them next to a piece of charcoal or something that we can date, we can get a range. Okay. So now when we pull one of these out of the ground or found in a field, even on the surface, we can get a sense of how old uh, a site is or how old the point style is. Because that technology change or that style right. changed over time. Right. And exactly. it could be just something simple of how it's shaped to mm -hmm. how it's notched or whether it's ground or not, things like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. That's fascinating. And you've also got drills, perforators, blades, cores. Now, what, what are these tools over here? Ooh-wee, that's a good question. <laughs> so perforators, right, as the name suggests, we thought that they were used to punch, uh, excuse me, punctate or poke holes in something, and we don't think that's true anymore. We looked at how they're used, the wear on these little perforators, and we think that they're used for scraping back and forth until we're left with kind of a, a thin section at the end, so they get worn out. So blades, are, as they are suggested, little blades for cutting. And they're like um, disposable razor blades. They're struck from these cores. You can see all the edges, the facets on those cores. Those are the flake scars that remain from striking blades. Oh, the okay. Cores. So you start with a core, you make a blade, and then you can use that beat up blade to create a perforator for scraping like fiber or something like that. That's really cool. So, so just like points are repurposed into other tools like drills, right. those cores begin as is raw material, you make the blade, and then those used up blades often turn into perforators. Okay, like a quick little X-Acto knife. Exactly. You know, use it and then wear it, once it wear down, it's, it's, it's gone, it's dusted. Right. Now, do you find that these, uh, for lack of a better word, arrowheads were projectile right. points. Projectile points. It's I a, like that. It's a wonderful catch-all term. You can say point for short. Okay. But remember, almost none of them are arrow points. Your only true arrow points are about as big as your first knuckle here. Okay. Very right. small. Sometimes even just your fingernail. Yeah. I've seen some that are about this big. Teeny, teeny, tiny. Yes. Exactly. Have there been any studies to see whether they were primarily used to cut meat or cut plant material or used for wood carving? Is there any kind of study that's been done to show that, that wear pattern? You can do it. Yeah, Has any can. been done here? No, not yet. Okay. So this is residue samples. There's a lot of ways you can go with it. Um, so you can do a lipids analysis, which is fat analysis. You can do blood cell analysis because when you look at the blood cells, the little crystals there are unique to each animal species. So they do that with a lot of paleo age points. Uh, but we haven't done any on this site yet. And you can also do starch analysis, phytoliths. What's pl that? Plant stones. So each plant has a unique phytolith if it's a starchy plant. So you can tell yeah. what species of plant was being cut? Yes. No way! Yes, she Seriously? Yes. I had no idea. <laughs> That's cool. Right, it is really cool. That is nuts. Huh. But we haven't done any of that on, on these points. We would have to have dirty points. We wouldn't be able to wash them or anything before we sent them for analysis. Okay, I got you. So that would have to be from a fresh excavation, which is fine because we do that periodically, usually yeah. once or twice a year. Yeah. And I see you've also got some large celts up here or adzes. Yeah. A, a celt is just an ungrooved axe. Okay. And adz is used for woodworking. Okay. So an axe is attached to the handle like this, and as is attached like this, okay. used for digging in instead of chopping. Okay. Right. So, yeah, these people were doing a lot of woodworking, right? They likely made a lot of dugouts for going out there, traveling the waters, because it's the best way to travel back then. So we can find lots of these artifacts on the site. Cool. So the next time you look at a arrowhead, remember, it's not an arrowhead. <laughs> Almost it, never. <laughs> almost never. It's a tool that's used to cut, whether it's used to cut meat or wood or whatever. It's a tool. Yeah, and it's also used to launch at a target, right? But not at the end of an arrow, often at the end of a throwing spear, dart, or even at the end of a spear for thrusting.
Yep. So a multitude of options. They're like an ancient Swiss army knife. One of the many things that you can learn here at this site. So we've got extensive amount of material that's coming in, into this site. Right. Can you explain some of that to us? Yeah. So archaeologists have estimated that the people brought in around 80 tons of stone over that 600 year span. It sounds like a lot, but it's, it's manageable, bring in little bits at a time, and they use it mostly to create tools, stone tools. They didn't use it to construct the earthworks. They, they used dirt for that. The thing is that none of it is local. The closest area we have for stone is right over here to the west of here, about 20, 30 miles that way. And you can see all these other dots. They all come from the Mississippi River Valley, uh, along with the Tennessee River Valley, and then some rivers down here in present day uh, Alabama and Georgia. So we're right here. Right. And exactly. we have materials coming from this whole huge area. Yeah. Parts of the southeast, the mid-south, and a little bit in the midwest up there. The Galena is probably the furthest stone that made it to the site. Wow. So what are the different types of rock that's coming into here? What, what do we have here? We have a wealth of things. That's what really makes this site pop. It's the first time that you have such extensive trade mm -hmm. or exchange or acquisition of material goods from so many sources. So you all we'll start here. Fort Payne Shirt, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Slate, parts of the lower Appalachians, Alabama, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Pickwick Shirt, that's North Alabama and Southern Tennessee. Hematite and Magnetite, these are both iron ores that come out of present day Arkansas near the Hot Springs area. Okay. And they were used mostly for, for plummets, which we think were nets on, on fishing, uh, excuse me, weights on fishing nets. Navaculite used for projectile points and other tools. Ozark white shirt comes from Ozarks. This is your local stuff. This mm -hmm. tan, sometimes red. Red jasper, we don't know the source. Red jasper is just a term for any shirt that is red. <laughs> so fun fact for you. That's pretty cool. Come from a lot of places. Uh, so even there, you see a whole bunch of sources and we have a lot more that we could talk about. Yeah, but, including galena and you've got yeah, copper and copper now the copper is wild because we thought it all came from the great lakes up there and we sent off six samples and it all came from an appalachian source that's fascinating so we're waiting on more testing to tell you if the copper all comes from the appalachians or if it comes from multiple sources yeah now is this all people from poverty point going to these areas and bringing stuff back or is it people from these areas bringing stuff to Poverty Point? Both could be true. We're not sure what the answer is. Mm -hmm. um, it, it depends on who's asking and what their perspective is. The thing is that we find all these materials come to the site mostly in raw form and the people shape them into localized point styles. Wow. So if there was actual trade of people bringing in the things from elsewhere, you would expect a lot of it to come finished. Right. But it almost never is. So, so was, most archeologists are leaning towards sort of an acquisition of the people at the site going out to quarry and collect and bring things back. That's cool. That's the, cool. Yeah, the only thing that might come finished are steatite vessels. They would have been very heavy to yeah. bring whole because some of them are like really, really big. Oh, wow. You can see how gradual the curve is on, on some of these big shirts or pieces of steatite. So do you have basically a, an artist, would you call it an artistic center here where you have artisans creating things out of a lot of exotic materials? I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my answer for you. Now, most of the artistic uh, pursuits doesn't come from the lithics, although it, it does. A lot of it is done in the fired earth where they really get creative. And you've got a few pieces of fired earth that are really unique, and I'd like yes. for us to check that out. Okay. Let's go look at that. <laughs> now, he, these are some pieces of dirt that have a more human touch to us. What do we have here? Right. So these are, are bits of fired earth, what we call. Um, and we can find some examples that were probably in the outside or inside of their ancient homes, which are made of wattle, which is a framework, and daw, the dirt that caked outside and gave, well, substance to that framework. So you can see the impressions 
of the mats uh, of woven cane or some kind of, of fibrous material uh, in this, this ancient fire earth. And it, Oh, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to say, and, and so that's uh, an, an indicator that you can tell what type of houses that they would have had, what type yeah. of construction they would have it had. It gives us a much better guess. Right, a better understanding. Because right. you can see, that's what's so cool about this is that, you know, you can see the, the in and out, the basket weave where I guess sticks or cane was woven between right. to create that, that solid surface for the dirt to adhere to. Right. That's just awesome. And then there's some others that are a little bit more personal touch to it. Yeah, I mean, we can find the people pressing the daub in. You can see the palm print of a person right over here. Wow. Or a thumbprint here. Or is someone just getting frustrated making a poverty point object and just crushing it in their hands. So you have all these palm prints. Wow. And just like we have issues with dirt daubers or mud wasps on our houses today, they did back then. So you have this bit of a mud wasp nest um, that was preserved after some kind of firing episode. Wow. Maybe the house burning down, which is likely why we have this bit of the dog fired like it is. Yeah. So even thousands of years ago, the mud bugs were still a problem. Yeah, mud wasps. <laughs> yeah. I don't I know don't... we have any uh, crawfish chimneys preserved, but I bet yeah. you there's one somewhere on yeah. the site. This is so cool and so amazing because this is i mean that that is their thumbprint that is their palms gripping that piece of clay that is their palm print pushing into it right and this is what their house would have looked like and that's one of the things that this site has to show you is is it brings you close to these people just as close as you can absolutely get yeah it's neat <laughs> So these are some of the highly decorated artistic, I guess you could say abstract objects that you have here yeah. on site. Right. Let us, what, what, what's going on here? Because these are those <laughs> cooking balls, but they're Different. a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, so these likely never saw the fires of cooking, right? They were likely standalone artistic pieces. Okay. So some are abstract in form. In fact, most are, which is unusual because usually art in this period takes a naturalistic form which you find some of. So there's a lotus pot up on that far end of that platform. Mm -hmm. You have a little spider web in the center. And oh, what is that's cool. often thought of as a little owl, you see those little two eye holes just yeah. pushed in there? So it's vaguely representative of an owl. Um, but you have a lot that are in these weird shapes, lots of cane punctations where mm -hmm. a piece of switch cane was just poked into the surface. Uh, you even have a few little pinch pots over in that far left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. um, and these are some of the things that travel long distances. So some of what people call mulberries, so those mottled-looking kind of grayish ones, mm -hmm. those are likely made of Gulf Coast soil. So they would come up from, from the Gulf along the coast of Louisiana, Mississippi. So it was made, it was made down there and brought right. up here to the yeah. site. Yeah, as okay. a little trinket saying, oh, we've been here and now we're going to leave a part of us here. That's cool. But that white stuff is kaolinitic uh, clay-rich soil from the Tennessee uh, River Valley. Wow. So we can find some of those objects down here. And they, that soil is definitely not from here. Yeah, and traveled a long way. but. You know, the fascinating thing about artwork is, is that it, it can give you an insight into their, their, their thinking almost, yeah. you know, and what they find interesting or aesthetically pleasing or, you know, fascinating. I mean, that spider web, I didn't recognize it until you just pointed it yeah. out. That's mind blowing. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a spider web. That's yeah, so cool. Or that little flat piece. It almost looks yeah, like a sun with sunbeams coming off of it. Oh, it does. You That's see the little cool. spiral of the yeah. sun and then the little beams coming off it. And that is interesting because we can recognize what those shapes mean. I find the abstract stuff more interesting because it was part of a culture that we don't understand today. Yeah. Right? I bet you these were meaningful for the people. And it's interesting that we have no idea what that meaning was. Wow. There's an impressive group of features behind us. What do we have going on here? So we've been talking about these ridges a lot, and I know y'all haven't seen them too well, except for now. So you can see them gently sloping down and ridges coming up. So you can see two really well-preserved ones behind me. 
Uh, and the ridges in this part of the site may have reached about six or seven feet tall, and some approach that height today have been much better protected in this part of the site. And keep in mind that if you stretch out the ridges end to end, that's six and a half miles of space. As far as footprint, construction, labor, these are the single largest earthwork at the site if you want to collect them all together. And so we're, we're all the way at the other end of the plaza that we were at earlier. Yeah. And so if you were to take all of those six rings and stack them together or, or how many are there there are four there's six ridges six ridges mm -hmm. they're if nested you... right inside each other like a rainbow okay and if you were to stretch that end to end it would go for six miles six and a half or so god that's insane yeah. now one mm -hmm. thing i noticed is that these ridges here seem more pronounced more prominent Absolutely. than they were on the other side what's you, the reason for that you are exactly right the difference is natural elevation so in the south end of the site that we came from, the nat natural elevation is higher. And the north here, the natural elevation is lower. And not only that, it was significantly lower at the time of construction. The ridges you see behind me are built on artificially leveled ground like the plaza. So there is a really low area here. It may have been a natural gully. It may have been a borrow area where they took dirt and used it for something. And then again, like the plaza, they said, wait guys let's fill it back in except this is extensive they filled in between eight and ten feet of dirt to bring the ground level up and make these ridges on top that's nuts that's so, that's a, a that's really a, big amount of, yeah. of dirt okay that seems to be a reoccurring theme here i mean it's just let's move dirt and put dirt here i mean yeah that's that's, a, that's lot of dirt. a big theme on the site is nearly everything you'll see today has been changed and shaped by the people you know, that's a fascinating thing to think about is, is when we look at the landscape, we think that it's the landscape that's always been throughout all of time. But human right. beings have been altering. That's what we do. Yes. Just like ants, you know, altering their landscape, we're altering ours. And for North America, this is just one of the most predominant places way back in time when right. they did that. Yeah. So one of the now you were telling me earlier about one of that these ridges are higher here and shorter there yeah. but that they're level at they're the level at the top right that's mind-blowing so they they wanted to create for some reason all of these ridges spanning this entire semicircle to be all the same height just about that's cool is yeah. there any speculation on why or thoughts or we don't know uh, yeah. we know that people lived on them <laughs> So if there's a big rainstorm, the benefit of ridges is your, your home doesn't get extra water law. Um, they picked a high spot already. They didn't have to deal with big flooding from the Mississippi. Uh, but having that extra height is going to be beneficial for your homes. Yeah. The shape, the semi-circular shape, excuse me, semi-elliptical, semi-oval shape, is likely ceremonial. We don't know why it took this form. Mm -hmm. But an oval or a circle is a very efficient use of space. Okay. Right? You can fit more homes on a semi-oval than you can on a semi-square or a semi-triangle, right, for yeah. the amount of work you do. That makes a lot of sense. So, yeah. there's likely a useful function, but also likely a ceremonial or a symbolic function to these ridges. And that seems to be a reoccurring theme with just about everything yeah. that, that you find is, is that there is a functional and possibly a religious or spiritual meaning to right. it as well. Yeah. So one thing that we can, we can see is, is that there's nobody here. So what happened to this group? Because we're, we're in the early or the late archaic. Correct. And we have mound building cultures that appear in the woodland and in the Mississippian, but here never again. And so what happened to these, to the people that lived here, you know, who spent so much time creating this site to just abandon it for all of time? Good question. Um, okay, so the native people created Poverty Point. They were a unique culture and they, they started phasing this site out by about 1100 BCE. So archaeologists, uh, we'll often talk about the quote-unquote abandonment of a site. And that's usually not entirely true. So if you spend all this time and effort creating your earthworks, you're going to try and hold on to it for as long as you can. Yeah. 
Now, one guy thinks that there is a climate change event making the weather a lot cooler and wetter for several hundred years. And if you're a hunter, a fisher, and a gatherer, and your food ways, your food acquisition is interrupted, that affects your population. So slowly over time, people start getting, well, moving into smaller and smaller groups, probably off-site, closer to different food sources, so you wouldn't have to compete with each other. And the culture is eventually lost, right, over time. So think about your ancestors, you know, 3,000 years ago. Has the culture changed a lot from that point to now? Yeah. Absolutely. So it's just this kind of slow fade into the past. Right. It probably took decades, if not a hundred years, for the complete abandonment of this site and the culture to be, you know, at least somewhat lost. Now we see that the local people that live in the period after this do uh, have some of the same material culture characteristics, but not very many. And that's called the Chifuncta culture, which begins about 800 BCE. And that's about 300 years after we don't see the site being used heavily. Wow. So there's a big gap where we don't find sites for about 300 years. So it's a little interesting. That is interesting. Do you think that possibly maybe they were finding or picking up artwork that came from Poverty Point and were like, wow, I haven't seen that ever. Maybe let's copy it or... Well, I think that there's some kind of continuation because it's a period directly afterward. Okay. And in fact, with the Chifuncta... But it's 300 years afterwards. Right. Okay. But the people were likely living in the area. We just don't find evidence of these sites. Okay. If those folks moved to the floodplain environment, all those sites would be under levels of deposited silt. So it's very hard to find oh, sites if it's cooler and wetter and more things are flooding. Um, so that's going to be hard to, to find the evidence. Okay. But in particular, during that Chifuncta culture, we can find miniature poverty point objects, but only a single shape, only the ones that are biconically shaped. But it's just something funny you see. That's and cool. And some of the projectile point styles are pretty similar too. Um, so we see some continuation of material culture. That's really cool. Yeah. So was there any habitation here in the Woodland or Mississippian period or even in the historic period? Right. So the next time we see bigger use of the site is going to be during the Coles Creek period, which is late woodland, mm -hmm. almost into the Mississippian period. So that is between 700 and 1100 CE or AD. Okay. We can find some use of the site. There is Mound D and that's part of the Coles Creek occupation. And there is a mound complex just to the south that was likely from this Coles Creek or late woodland occupation. And then of course, during the historic period, the site takes its name from a plantation that was named Poverty Point. That's where- That's the, where the name comes that's, from. It's okay. a his, historic place name. So people are farming and plowing. That's why lots of the ridges are not very well developed today. Natural erosion, but also interruption by plows. Right. So. This has been an awesome exploration of one of the most remarkable sites I've, we've been to on this trip. I cannot thank you enough for having us out and showing us around. If people want to get a hold of, hold of you or people want to come tour the site, what's some information that they can look up online? Well, that's a good question. Uh, happy to have you, first of all. Thanks. So, thanks a bunch, Chase. Yeah. Uh, but the site is a World Heritage Site. We're operated by Louisiana State Parks. So lastateparks.com, and we have our page there with our calendar of events. Uh, we're open almost every day of the year, open seven days a week, just closed uh, for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Day. Uh, and once you get here, you can explore by yourself, but we also do guided tours and programs and things like that. Uh, if you want to reach out and call us, our site number is 318-926-5492, and you should be able to get hold of us. Cool. Well, thank you for having us out, and thank you for bringing all them with us on this trip. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for joining us. This has been awesome, guys. You are watching Chasing History, and if you have an opportunity, go down there and click that subscribe button. Leave us some comments. Tell us how we're doing. If we did a terrible job, tell us we did a terrible job. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it. We will be grateful for it, and always remember, history rocks. Woo!